Joe, um, I feel like the conversation is, is, is changing direction a bit where we're asking less and trying to discern more about where we're headed giving the troubling presidency that we're dealing with. Well, I think, I actually think that Mark Sanford's uh, defeat <clears throat> in South Carolina won was a defining moment for the Republican yeah. Party. I say that because <clears throat> Mark um, was a conservative's conservative for years, got through a scandal that the Republican voters were perfectly fine with, uh, but couldn't get past uh, saying one or two bad things about Donald Trump. Listen, this guy has a lifetime 93% rating from Glo Club for Growth. 92% lifetime average from Heritage Action and a 91% American Conservative Union lifetime average. And somehow he was insufficiently Trumpist to win his own primary. Let's bring in right now uh, still the congressman uh, for South Carolina one, but a recently liberated man, Mark <laughs> Sanford. Mark. It's uh, always great to see you. Um, let me uh, let me first of all uh, let me just ask you to give us your reflections on what happened the past couple of days and during the campaign. Well, short and simple as I got beat, but but I, I think the, the 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 themes that come from it have implications, as you suggest, for a whole lot of other races out there, and sort of um, our belief in institutions in this country, and what the Republican Party is ultimately about. So I guess I'd say, uh, in shortest shortest form, we you know swear an allegiance to the Constitution and we pledge allegiance to the flag. And what was weird about this race uh, that I've never experienced before in any race that I've been a part of was an allegiance question uh, where people say, are you for or against the president? I'd, I'd give sort of a nuanced answer. You know, I, I, I'm with them most of the time, but I've disagreed on a couple of issues when they've been inconsistent with the promises that I made in running or my belief in terms of conservative philosophy or the very people that I represent. If you look at my rating, I've basically voted with them 89% of the time, disagreed with them a handful of times. And and yet the answer would be, no, I want to know you're for or against the president. And again, mm -hmm. I'd say, look, I love my brothers and sisters, but I'm not with them all the time. I agree that uh, uh, I've never before had a question of allegiance to a person rather than allegiance to the flag and the Constitution. And to a degree, that's what this race came down to. Well, and that's what's so frightening is that it really is, it seems like a personality cult where you have to have, you, you, you don't pledge an oath to the Constitution of the United States. You don't uh, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. It goes directly to Donald Trump. I've known you for a quarter of a century now. <clears throat> I know the first time I met you, uh, you got all the incoming freshmen in, and you had a chart, and you showed us uh, the challenges facing us on the, the federal deficit, the federal debt, entitlement spending. You basically predicted where we were going. And I would like to say, when people say that I'm a squish or I've changed this way, or I'd love to say, yes, I'm actually nuanced enough to do that. But like me, you've been saying the same thing about trade, about deficits, about debt, about entitlement spending for a quarter of a century. You've been saying the same exact thing, more so than anybody else I came into Congress with <clears throat> in 1994. How does it change? Like, like People that have known you for a quarter of a century and heard you saying, I'm for free trade. I'm for balancing the budget. Let's not spend so much money. Let's reform entitlements. Let's save Social Security. What do they say when they look into your eye and know you're saying the same exact thing you've been saying for over two decades now? Well, that's the puzzle of, again, this race and something that I'm trying to figure out myself. But what I'd say is um, those traditional merit badges, if you will, did not matter in this race. And, and, and obviously, it, it actually, it was a close race. It was a very divided race. I mean, it's, it was separated by about 3,000 votes. 
But but at the end of the day, for the people that voted against me, um, those things, those traditional markers of conservative philosophy, market principle, and constitutional rule of of the American system, those merit badges didn't 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 matter. And that is again something that I think has alarming consequences for races that go well beyond the first district of South Carolina. Congressman, it's Willie Geist. It's good to see you. As you mentioned, the race was tight. Do you believe the president's late tweet in which he criticized you and said you have not been helpful to the MAGA agenda, as he put it, and also raised your 2009 story in Argentina? Do you believe that cost you the election? Well, I think it's the larger climate of Trump versus not that cost me an election. I, I think that that probably prevented me from going into a runoff. I mean, a couple hundred votes would have put us in a runoff. Right. But, 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 but I think that there are a couple interesting things about that tweet. One, when's the last time a Republican president got into a congressional race, particularly if you're supposedly negotiating a deal in the Far East? Uh, I mean, so the, his degree of focus on personal <laughs> things, if, you know, if, 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 if you offend me, I'm coming back to get you, is, is again, a, a, a little bit outside the norm, uh, to say the least. But more interesting is it wasn't the truth. Um, it was just a flat-out lie. If you, if, that's why Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan and people like that have risen to my defense to say, wait a minute, this guy voted for all of the president's agenda, yet he sends a tweet out saying, you're not supportive of my agenda. So what do you suggest now, then, as we come up on the fall, to candidates running for re-election? Because on the one hand, you want to keep your job to continue to push in Washington the conservative ideals and the policies you believe in. On the other hand, it appears that crossing Donald Trump in any way, as you point out, you've been supportive of him, but crossed him a couple of times, could cost you that seat. So what's your political advice to Republicans running this fall about how to handle Donald Trump? Uh the politics are easy. Uh, uh, pledge allegiance to Donald Trump. Um, but I think that's a mistake at a soul level. Um, it was interesting in, in my concession speech uh, the other night, had my four boys with me. And it was a profoundly moving moment when afterward they hugged me and they said, Dad, we're proud of you. And so I think we all got to sort of look inside of each one of our souls and say, um, where, where, where am I in this? You know, there are always trade-offs in politics, and we got to recognize that, that that's the tug of war of, 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 of policy versus, of, you know, district and go down the list. But I, I, I think everybody's got to answer that question for themselves, and I would wish them well. But I would say we have, I, I've, been, I've been amazed at the number of different members who've come up to me over the last 24 hours since I've been back here on the Hill and have talked about a tribalism component to what's going on in, in the party and with the Trump uh, effect that worries them and that they've never seen before. So, so, Congressman, following up on the thread of that conversation, yesterday we had former Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson here who expressed real regret at your loss. Mm. Just listen to what he said yesterday. I am um, these days uh, a little depressed about, frankly, the state of our politics. Yeah. Um, we have a president who denigrates the institutions of his own government, which I simply cannot get my head around. And then when we look at the primary results last night from South Carolina, Mark Sanford, who in my experience is a very thoughtful member of Congress. He was on the House Homeland Security Committee. He would sit through the entire hearing. He was the most junior member, so he'd be last. But he'd always ask the most intelligent, insightful question. And it wasn't a knee-jerk question requiring a knee-jerk response. And so it's, it's depressing to me to see a thoughtful member of Congress like that uh, lose re-election. And so this morning, maybe you can help us out here, because there seems to be a growing divergence in defining the difference between Trumpism and conservatism. And this morning also, on the front page of the New York Times, there is a picture of a young two-year-old child uh, being separated from her mother at the border. From, they're from Honduras. They're be, she is being separated from her mother in tears at the border. And as a conservative, as an American, as someone who respects the borders and wants border security, help us out here. How would a conservative look at this issue and other issues as compared to Trumpism looking at this issue and other issues? What is a conservative today? 
conservative is what a conservative has always been, which is one who has a rightful and legitimate suspicion of, of government's growth, one who believes in what Jefferson talked about, wherein there's a dividing line with government on one side and at times liberty on the other, and there's a healthy tension between between those two, and oftentimes in as much one, one side grows, the other side shrinks. So, I mean, I could go through the traditional components of conservatism, but I go back to what I keep hearing since I've been back here on the Hill since my defeat, which is uh, a, a lot of talk about, well, that's not what we have right now. We have a form of tribalism, and, and we have a breach of, you know, one of the great components of the institutional setup of the Founding Fathers, which is they divided legitimately power across the executive, legislative, and judicial branch so that we would be checks upon the other and that there would be indeed vigorous debate. And this idea that if you challenge somebody and say, look, I hear where you're coming from, but the folks back home are saying something different and therefore I gotta go a different way and here's the reasons for doing so, if that becomes something that's unacceptable in the course of American politics, we got a real problem because that's exactly what the Founding Fathers set up, which is a healthy tension wherein there was to be debate, there was to be dissent, well, not, not, not pledges of allegiance, if you want to call them that. I, I do think we have a real problem. I think we need to come to terms with that, Elise. Congressman, you wrote an op-ed saying that Donald Trump should release his tax returns. And that this, uh, the lack of knowledge surrounding Donald Trump's personal financial interest has continued to plague this administration and to the point of we don't know if our foreign policy is being decided by Trump or Kushner family interest. Are you still going to push for the release of the tax returns? I, I made my point clear on that. It didn't go on anywhere, but I made my point clear because it's a 50-year tradition that has served this country very, very well, wherein every president, Republican or Democrat, has done so. But more importantly, and this is as a former governor, I released my tax returns twice as I became the nominee for my party back home. There was a value to the taxpayer in doing that. People could look. It was another data point where they could say, uh, "Do I, you know, what, why is he doing this, or where is this coming from?" It cleared up gray area. It cleared up question. And if you don't have a president releasing their tax return, make certain that, believe me, governors across this country, go gubernatorial candidates across this country, won't be releasing theirs. So I think it's something that has effect well beyond the president's returns, but really to the larger tradition that's been adhered to for more than 50 years in this country. All right, uh, conservative champion and uh, steadfast uh, warrior for conservative causes for over a quarter of a century, Mark Sanford, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we're grateful for uh, you, you, you coming on the show and we hope to see you again sometime soon. I appreciate it, Joe. Thanks, Thanks so much. Congressman. Thank you so much for being on. All right. Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.